Christoph, in trying to understand what science is about, we have a field called philosophy of science, where philosophers or scientists uh, look at the, the deep meaning of science and, and, and what it, and, and what it uh, purports to be and what it can be. The new thinking that you've done about consciousness, looking at consciousness not just purely on a reductive way, trying to figure out how the brain does it, but, but seeing something more, an expansion of the, the way we understand the physical world to, to uh, explain experience. How does that reflect on the whole scientific project? Because, the, uh, because this is something so radical that many of your fellow neuroscientists would think that uh, you've, uh, you've walked the bridge too far. Well, I think it's just a traditional process of science at work here that early on, if you look at in the history of science, going back all the way to the Greeks, early on we just had, before there was even physics, there was just metaphysics. These were all metaphysical questions. You know, what is matter? What stuff? Is there universal stuff? Is everything made out of fire or water or air? Is a peaceful particle of a thought? And so as science advances, um, questions that used to be purely metaphysical speculation now become amenable to, to scientific analysis. The question, for example, what are stars made out of? For a long time it was believed by philosophers that it could never be answered because clearly we can never get to stars. Well, now we have spectroscopy and we have you know, X-ray te telescopes and other things, so we can know. It was thought that, that life requires some new laws, that life couldn't be studied by, by physics and chemistry. Well, it turned out the same good old laws of chemistry and physics apply to, organic, to, to inorganic systems. So I think this is just a further extension that something as basic and as weird as consciousness, weird in the sense that it seems to be very different from anything else we encounter, yet it's very basic because the only way I know what the world is through my conscious experiences can also be studied by, by, scientific, uh, by scientific empirical mathematical type of thinking. You and I have uh, been uh, friends and colleagues for, for a long time, and I remember a time when you didn't think this way. Uh, did I get that right? I used um, early on, so, so I'm doing this now since 25 years, and we, we, we've been talking yeah. almost as long. So yeah. early on, I was, I was much more skeptical about, about, about this larger project of trying to see how consciousness fits into the overall picture of the, um, of the world, in particular trying to do it in a very mathematical and formal and theoretical sense. That's why Francis Crick, with, with whom I worked, yeah. the Nobel laureate Francis Crick and I, uh, early on focused in our search on the neuronal correlates of consciousness, which is now a fairly popular experimental subject. In other words, you look for the signature, for the footprints of consciousness in the brain. So you, for example, typical experiments, you put a, people, a person in a magnetic scanner, you show him something, he sees it, then you do what's called masking, you hide the image from view, but it's still present on the eyes, but you don't see it, mm -hmm. using various tricks that psychologists have invented. So now you can look at the difference between when my brain when my brain responds to it, but I don't see it versus when yeah. I actually see it, and which parts of the brain are involved, and what are the signature of consciousness. Right, right. But and so this project is ongoing. There are many people and many labs that do this now, and I eventually will discover it's going to be these neurons in this, in this part of the brain that are involved whenever I'm conscious. But now we have to take the next step, and that I didn't take before. Okay, so why is it, these parts of, why is it this part of the brain, not that? Why is it, for instance, something people look at is 40 hertz oscillation, a particular type of neuronal oscillation that you can see from the outside using EG that we, at that Crick and I thought early on is associated with consciousness. Well, let's say it is 40 hertz oscillation. Why 40 hertz? Why not 30 hertz oscillation? Why not 10 hertz oscillation? What is it special about 40 hertz? So finally, we need a theory that tells us not only uh, based on the hardware of the brain, not only based on the behavior that you can talk about, what is it fi fundamentally that gives rise to conscious sensation? And this, this step took me, uh, you know, a lot of thinking, realizing that this really, this is what's required. You need to go beyond the behavioral and beyond the neuronal college of consciousness to get at the actual phenomena itself. It was part of it caused by uh, the term neural correlates of consciousness be, became part of our literature and people would talk about that and then some would criticize it as saying that these are correlations but they are not revealing anything at all. And, and really making no progress at all about the, the perception, the inner, the inner experience. No, it was really <laughs> a question asked by now uh, the neurologist, Volker Henn, in a seminar I gave. So at the time I, I proceedalized, I felt we, we need to get the good message out to all my 60,000 year scientist colleagues yeah. that you can now study consciousness yeah, yeah. using good old fashioned right, right, right. reduction your scientist. Right. And then that's I the Christoph Koch I remember. Yes, and, that, and that's true. <laughs> and then, so I gave the seminar. At the end, he said, Volker Hens, I have a question. 
how is your attempt to say consciousness associated with um, prefrontal cortex and foliar oscillation? How is that different from René Descartes saying it all it comes is associated with the pineal gland? <laughs> there was a sucker punch. That was really that really made me think very very hard because in some sense you can say okay. Descartes pointed at the pineal gland, we think today that's wrong, so we point now at 40 hertz oscillation, so let's say that's right. So again, that doesn't explain what is it about this particular neural mechanism that gives rise to consciousness. And then you can say any neural mechanism, whatever the mechanism is that gives rise to consciousness, whatever the physical, the material basis of consciousness is, you have to ask, why this material basis? Why not something else? And, and does it generalize to other material bases? And does it generalize to all animals? And does it generalize to plants and, and protozoa and aliens and, you know, our creatures, computers, robots, the internet? Mm. Yeah, so, so when you look at this whole picture uh, and, and reflect on your uh, 25 years of studying this, how, how, how does it make you feel? It makes me feel good because I'm the, the primary driving force in my life. The, the question I want to answer before I die. This is what keeps me up late at night. And, and this ceaseless, I'm looking, I want to know where this most mysterious aspect of the universe that I find myself in, consciousness comes from. And I, I feel I'm now beginning, we, we're now on the right trail. The theory by, by my colleague Giulio Tononi is along the right trail that provides a satisfactory answer that ex, that's compatible with everything we know about the facts about consciousness, that's measurable, that's testable, and that will ultimately will explain how the water of the brain is turned into the wine of our conscious experience. <laughs>